Coming up, a crisis of character. One former Secret Service agent reveals what really went on in the Clinton White House. And then, April 2nd, 2014. They have an active shooter currently on Fort Hood. A gunman takes aim. I went numb. Right at her husband. Oh my gosh, don't tell me John was shot. Gunshot victim, don't some people that are escaping from the Well, welcome to the 700 Club. You know, I don't usually have to make this disclaimer, but this program might not be suitable for children. We've got a man who was there watching the Clintons in the Clinton White House when Bill Clinton was president of the United States. And this book tells us some of the things that happened. It's called Crisis of Character. And uh, the Secret Service agent was there. Uh, well, he's had 30 years of experience in serving our country, and he will be talking to us in a few moments. Well, he says that the private Hillary Clinton was very different from what people saw in public. Jennifer Wishon has the story. As a uniformed officer in the Secret Service, Gary Burns stood guard outside the Oval Office while the Clintons served inside. It was his dream job, but Byrne witnessed things that led him to speak out in his new book. Crisis of Character, a White House Secret Service officer discloses his firsthand experience with Hillary, Bill, and how they operate. He details how Hillary belittled Secret Service officers on her detail, even throwing a Bible at one agent, hitting him on the head. In front of cameras, he says the former First Lady was warm and friendly, but outside the public eye, he says she was cold, emotional, and even dangerous. Byrne reveals he tried to keep Monica Lewinsky away from President Clinton and that he concealed other affairs the president had inside the White House, including one with Eleanor Mondale, the daughter of former Vice President Walter Mondale. Before she died, Eleanor suggested she and the president were just friends. And Clinton allies are also fighting back, saying Byrne didn't have the access that he claims. But as Hillary Clinton now seeks the White House, Byrne writes that from the bottom of his soul, he knows she lacks the integrity and temperament to serve as president. Well, former Secret Service officer Gary Byrne is joining us now from Washington. Gary, I want to ask you something. You know, I, I had that presidential thing, and I had a detail, and I did a lot of talking in front of those men, but I was under the impression that they had signed a non-disclosure agreement where they couldn't talk about that. How did you get free so you could talk? Well, first of all, good morning, sir. I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. Um, at the time that uh, I was in the Secret Service uh, Uniform Division, there was uh, not a non-disclosure disclosure agreement. And to be honest with you, um, I never thought I would be compelled to do this. Um, but as time went on in the last couple of years, I feel uh, it's, I feel I have to, I feel it's my duty to let the American people know what the truth is. Um, this woman's about to become president of the United States and uh, I, I, I don't think it's a good thing. Based on what I saw in my years there, uh, I don't think it's a good thing. Clearly, I've um, made a decision to go forward and, and tell these things that, that normally wouldn't be told. But it's not the first time um, Somebody from the Secret Service has done this. And I'd also like to point out that um, I wasn't the one that compelled me to, be, to testify. You know, it was President Clinton's behavior that brought myself and all these other Secret Service employees into this Monica Lewinsky scandal. It was their behavior that set this up. You know, you point out in here, and I remember very clearly, he held out and said, I have not had sex with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. True? False. False. Uh, the testimony tells it. And, you know, when he made that statement, myself and the other officers and agents that knew they would be involved in this, it, it made us sick to our stomach because we knew they were going to drag us through this. Instead of the president doing the right thing and stepping forward and, and, and telling the truth, um, he decided to try to evade and ended up dragging everybody into this and, and making himself look very bad. Gary, I want to read something that's in here. I thought to, to set things up. Let's say it straight out. Hillary Clinton lied about the reason for the Benghazi attack. She lied about it to the nation as a whole, and she lied right in the faces of grieving family members uh, of those who died there, then lied about her lying. And she keeps telling Americans one huge, disgusting lie after another. 
As I wrap up writing this book, Hillary has claimed that, quote, we didn't lose a single person in Libya, unquote. Really? Try telling that to the families of the four men we lost on September the 11th, 2012. Not long before Mrs. Clinton committed this, that amazing, bizarre falsehood, the late Sean Smith's mother, Pat, broke down on national television, exclaiming, quote, Hillary is a liar. I know what she told me. Pat went on to say that she wanted to see Hillary in jail for her misdeeds at Benghazi. She's been lying. She's turned the whole country into a bunch of liars. Two decades ago, the late New York Times columnist William Sapphire wrote, Americans of all political persuasion are coming to the sad realization that our first lady, a woman of undoubted talents, who was a role model for many in her generations, is a congenital liar. That's a pretty strong indictment. You, you really believe that? I mean, you you, you have firsthand, uh, uh, you know, uh, examples of her lying. Could you give us a couple of them? Well, the, the things I cite in my book, Crisis of Character, um, <laughs> is mostly about her behavior. But but certainly, um, the the case that you cite with Mrs. Smith, where I mean, how do you tell a grieving mother one thing? And then later on, she finds out the truth is, is something else. And at the same time that she's lying to, the, to this mother, she's texting other people and telling them what the truth is, that it was a terrorist attack. Um, that's the best example that, that I've seen recently. Um, other examples that I cite in my book, Crisis of Character, when I work there, um, there's many of them. I, I can't think of one offhand right now, All right, well, but let's, um, let's there's many to, of them. Let's go to something you did notice. There was a vase, apparently, the. White House is like a museum with all these treasured artifacts. And you heard a crash and a vase was smashed, thrown by Hillary at her husband, correct? Could you tell us about well, that? Well, that's uh, not exactly the okay. way. I came, in, I came in to work one morning, Pat, and um, I was talking to my coworkers and they were telling me that there had been a, a big fight upstairs. And uh, I know this sounds a little voyeuristic, but you have to put it in context. The White House is very old. There's big stairwells, elevator shafts, and, the, and they were yelling so loud the sound came down. And during this fight, they heard a crash. When it was investigated, they found somebody found a, a broken vase. Now, this has been reported as a broken lamp or, or something else, but it was a, a vase. Because shortly after my friend told me the story, I walked over to the White House curator's office, looked inside, and there was the broken vase in a cardboard box. And based on the reaction of the curator that was in there, I was sure that that's exactly what I was looking at. Uh, and, well, you, you talked about the fact that this was a relationship of deceit, that when they were close together, they didn't touch, they didn't uh, embrace, they weren't kissing, they weren't close. Yet before cameras, suddenly they're holding hands and hugging. And uh, was it all a charade? Is that what you're saying? I think to a certain extent. I mean, I, I wasn't. Don't get me wrong, I didn't live up in the private living quarters with them. But when I saw them, which you might call private, like, you know, walking around the complex or, or, refer, or talking to each other, yeah, it didn't seem, it seemed like a business relationship at best. Well, what about uh, her? I mean, did she ever talk to you? You, you mentioned she threw things at one of the Secret Services. I understand she hit somebody over the head with a Bible. Was it was, you know, on the way to church or something? Was that what happened? Yeah, so one uh, morning I was standing post and with an agent outside the Oval Office. And I said to him, I, I heard somebody got hit with a Bible. What happened? And he said, it was me. And he said he was on the South Grounds in the limousine. He was driving. The First Lady was sitting behind him. And, and for some reason, she was irate about something. And she had a Bible in her hand. And she struck him in the back of the head with the Bible for some reason. And um, he... It made him very mad. He turned around and he made it very clear to her. He turned around the best he could sitting in that car. And he uh, just, just described to her that that wasn't going to be acceptable behavior. And um, he reported it up the chain of command. But basically their attitude with this kind of thing is that's the way she is. That's what's going to happen. It's not the first incident and it won't be the last. Well, talk about this explosive thing. Would, would, what would set her off in terms of anger? Was it... Uh trivial things or major things? Well, to me, they were trivial things. I mean, if you're going to work at that level in the government, you really have to have a, <clears throat> you really have to have a perspective of what's important. And what's important is people's lives and protecting your country. Here's an example, uh, a good example, Pat, is um, one morning I was 
going to get some information for a tour and uh, I was up in the social office which traditionally is where the first lady works and there was three women up there that worked with Mrs. Clinton these were co-workers and friends from Arkansas and they were having this discussion and they 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 seemed very agitated to the point where I actually thought something was wrong I asked if somebody was sick if there was something wrong and they said no that there had been a mistake made by an intern ordering these invitations for the White House and the invitations were useless. And their, their anxiety was not that the invitations were useless and that they, somebody wasted all this money. They were terrified to have to tell who was going to tell the first lady that a mistake had been made. And that, that always stuck with me. I'm like, this is somebody you're working for all these years and you're terrified to tell her that a mistake made, was made. It's just, it's just, and as time went on, I saw many examples of this. Well, give us some more of them. What else? Well, the, well, the example that we just talked about, about the agent being struck with the Bible. And then another time I was um, asked to do a tour of the uh, Oval Office, my uh, old post, for some guests of the Clintons from Arkansas. And this staff member wanted to bring them over and leave them in the Oval Office, and which is not acceptable. Th there's many l rules and guidelines that dictate how people, um, when the president's not in the Oval Office, how the staff or the family can go in and go out of there. So I explained to the staff member that um, it, what she wanted to do wasn't possible, but she could escort them and then take them across the hallway to the Roosevelt Room. So um, she said this wasn't acceptable, and the staff member berated me, and I'm going to tell Mrs. Clinton. And i, I got to tell you, as I'm retelling the story again, it just seems so childlike. But uh, so a little while later, the first lady comes down, and she berates me, and um, uses some, you know, a little bit of harsh language and tells me they're tar she's tired of dealing with us. and. And I tried to explain to her that these are rules and guidelines that are set in law. And uh, I would try to accommodate her. And after she berated me a, uh, a little bit more, I finally you know, said, listen, just when your guests are done in the Oval Office, um, you can put them in the, I'll put them in the Roosevelt Room and that'll be the end of it. Um, but the, these, were, these interactions with her, with my coworkers, were, um, there were many others. Um, I have a couple more if you had the time. Go ahead, I'm listening. Sure. Um, Two officers, um, they were pretty new to the job. They'd been on about a, at least a, a, about a less than a year. And um, one morning I was in a break room and one of the officers came down and uh, he said, um, today's a weird day. I said, uh, how's that? And he said, well, the, um, I just said hello to the first lady and, and she told me to go to, to, go to hell. And, um, you know, we kind of looked at him and we said, well, you know, you're going to get used to that. She's, she seems hostile towards us. She, she doesn't, you know, we told him our opinion, what we experienced was she didn't seem to like the military or law enforcement. So as we're talking, another guy comes over and he goes, that's nothing. He said, uh, a month ago, I said good morning to her and she told me to go myself. And um, so a sergeant overheard us and... Um, he reported it up the chain of command, and this, the senior people in the Secret Service took it pretty serious. They came over, they talked to him about it, they apologized, but they explained to him basically the same thing we had told him, that the First Lady was kind of hostile towards us at times, and uh, that's the way it was. Well, she used but he that, wanted, that kind of language. You're talking about the F word. She used that, yes, sir. dressed him, and told him to go blank himself. Yes, sir. You know, people now, don't talk that way. Certainly the no. First Lady of the United States. Listen, I don't mind if people use Saudi language, but why would you say that to the man that has been up all night protecting you? Yeah. And, and another significant thing about that story, the second person I was describing, three years before that, he was a veteran in the U.S. He was in the U.S. Army, excuse me. And um, he was on a mission in Somalia, uh, early on in Somalia. Not like we would today you would think is what we would call Black Hawk Down, but this was before that. And he, he received a Purple Heart for being wounded. And three years later, he gets a job with the Secret Service, and the First Lady of the United States tells him to go F himself. I'm sorry, that's never acceptable. The uh, big thing in this book has to do with the cover-up. Uh, and this Monica Lewinsky, this young girl, 20 years old, 21, whatever, however old, 19, however, you know, whatever. Right, she was, she was 21 or 22. 21 or 22, okay. Well, she was trying to get in, apparently, and... What you had in there was so shocking that there's a secret telephone number with all kinds of codes associated with it, only for the President of the United States. And Bill Clinton gave Monica Lewinsky that number. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, I believe so. And um, so here's how it happened. One morning, and at this point, as things were happening, I still gave, tried to give the president the benefit of the doubt. Even though um, what I saw led me to believe that these things were going on, and some of the Secret Service agents would tell me, Gary, you know, when we're on the road, you don't know what goes on sometimes. So one Saturday morning, Monica Lewinsky um, showed up at the Oval Office. She was still an intern at the time. And she, um, she tried to deliver a stack of papers, which is basically news clippings. And on this Saturday, there was no staff in yet. So she came up and she said, I had to deliver this, which was ridiculous. Um, first of all, the president had two copies of what she had already because I put them in the Oval Office that morning when I opened the, opened the office up. So, um, you know, I told her that she, you know, she shouldn't be here and she left. Well, about five minutes later, she, um, I'm sorry, about five minutes later, the, the Oval Office door opens up and the president comes out with this kind of grin on his face and he says, hey, officer, have you seen um, anybody trying to del deliver something to me? And I said, uh, uh, well, sir, um, if I do, I'll let you know. And he kind of smiled at me and he shut the door. So um, I looked at the agent and he said, uh, Gary, you just, you just don't know what's going on. So that's when I kind of came to the conclusion that, that these rumors were true. So a short time later, um, Monica showed back up and she um, went into the Oval Office. I knocked on the door and I let her, let her in. So when she showed up the first time, she would have had to go and call him. I know she went into the West Lobby and made a phone call. So she had to have called the president. And then you just can't pick up the phone and get the president. You have to call on that line unless you're the chief of staff. But uh, she was not. And um, that's what I testified to in my testimony when I was compelled to testify uh, by subpoena uh, six times. You, there's a heart-rending story in here about a Navy chief, I guess he's Filipino, who loves this country and loves the office of president. And he had to do some unsavory business with uh, dirty linen. You want to tell us about that? Sure. One day, uh, standing my post outside the Oval Office, the Navy steward, Nell, uh, came up to me. And I could tell he was a little distraught. And he said, you know, Byrne, I'm, I'm tired of cleaning up this mess. And I, I saw what he had in his hand, towels. And, and, um, and uh, I kind of knew what he was talking about. And uh, so I decided to, um, and at this time, we had no idea there was an investigation going on. So those towels would have gone right to the Navy mess, and they would have washed them. And those guys know where the towels come from. And, you know, they're, they're um, men in the military. They know what that stuff looks like on towels. So um, I decided it was best to get rid of the towels to try to protect the president's reputation. Uh, I, the last thing he needed at this point was another scandal. So I grabbed the plastic bag. I had Nell throw them in there, and I destroyed the towels. Well, sometime later, when the star investigation uh, started subpoenaing us, I was, I was afraid that I, that might be considered uh, destroying evidence. But luckily, it wasn't. So you're talking, these are hand towels with, with the president's semen on them that were going into to the wash, and the poor guy, the, the mess uh, chief was just distraught that that was the way the president yes. was acting. Yes. And, and you know, um, a couple of people have come out and uh, tried to discredit my story, saying that what I've just said to you was different than my testimony. I would just like to clarify that there was different incidences. There was incidences with hand towels, with tissue, and I only testified to what they asked me. I couldn't tell them everything. There were so many rules and so many lawyers involved in this when it was happening. It was mind bottling. When you read, if you get a chance to read my book, Crisis of Character, you'll see that. How many women were involved with, with uh, Clinton during that time? Do you have any idea? I do not. I, I know of three incidences that I testified to, and, uh, but I have no idea. Well, you had one thing in your book where Monica was trying to get in to see him, and he was in having sex with some other woman at, at the time, and you couldn't open the door? Well, uh, to, to clarify, I, I was standing post outside the Oval Office, and he was meeting with somebody, but um, I, I believe it was like a legitimate meeting. Mm. Now, what you're describing is, at the same time, Monica Lewinsky was outside at the Northwest Gate trying to get in. And his president's secretary, Betty Kerry, was trying to keep her outside until this meeting was over with this other person because she didn't want them to cross paths. Mm. And uh, Betty told the officer at the gate, 
who was um, in there. And the officer mentioned it out loud. And when Monica heard this, she got very upset. And she actually made the statement of something to the effect that you, she, he's in here with her when he has this out here waiting for him. And the officers uh, that told me the story, it, it was so bizarre to them. They, uh, it was like we were living in an alternative world. Gary, what did Mrs. Clinton, Hillary Clinton, know about her husband? She must have known a lot about it. Did, did she display anger? Did you hear her screaming about you philandering so-and-so, how could you kind of thing? I never heard that per se, but I will tell you that um, based on the reports I remember at the time and, and what I know from my coworkers at the White House, the first time that she heard that the Lewinsky thing was real was when the president's attorney went over and told her. And I noticed a huge change in, in her demeanor for a while. Like, I don't, want, I, I don't want to use the word depression, but she seemed very angry and sad. And, and who could blame her? But let's face it, from what we know now, that this wasn't the first time, and all those rumors from Arkansas are probably true. Um, based, on, based on what I saw, I think it was. So this wasn't her first time with this. Um. You have said in your book you don't think she's got the character to be president. Do you want to expand on that one? Yes, sir. I think the best example, although this isn't actually in my book, um, she doesn't have the character, and I'll use this as an example. When she was Secretary of State, we had the incident in Benghazi. Somebody with character, somebody who was a real leader, would have stayed on as Secretary of State and took the steps and put procedures in place that would never let that happen again. Instead of shifting blame, making up lies, and, and telling the families lies, and then just moving on and starting to run for president. A leader fixes things and gets it right and then moves on. You don't have any knowledge of the Clinton Foundation or the various uh, money that has come uh, to them from foreign sources. Do you, you know anything about that? No. Or? That's just easy. know what I, I just know what's been reported, sir. Okay, well, Gary, we, we appreciate this, and uh, I'm sure your your book's going to be a bestseller already. I think on Amazon, and uh, well, thank you. It's called Crisis of Character, and appreciate it. it was courage to come out and say what you said, and there's a lot more, ladies and gentlemen, in this book. So, um, what do you think? Wow, thank you, thank you sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. It. Well, uh, you know, I'm sure that some of this could be recounted by others who were oh, in yeah. service there at the same time. And honestly, I mean, I don't think anybody's really surprised. Maybe we don't know the details of it, but you can't see the things you've seen mm -hmm. happen and not question the character. Well, of how people. could the American people want that kind of thing again? We had eight years of it. You know, I, I have said so many times that the people most recently that I am most compassionate about are the parents of those men in Benghazi. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just can't imagine. We saw that picture of, of Mrs. Clinton and the president and a few others sitting around a table watching, mm. you know, video played out of well, what happened. The, the, and you just go, how does somebody do that? She emailed a relative that this was a terrorist attack going on in Libya. At the same time, she is instructing her agent to go before the American people and talk on all those Sunday talk shows and say it was because of a um, anti-Muslim video on on cable, which was nonsense. Those, but she said it was a, a, a you know she just lied about it. Well, maybe the most stinging thing to me was when she had to testify a while after yeah. that to make a statement like, what difference does it make now, yeah. Yeah. was just so incredibly insensitive. It kind of took your breath away a little bit. Well, this is what's going on. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this is the book. It's called A Crisis of Characters. There's a whole lot more in here that we didn't get a chance to talk to. But Gary uh, was there. and. Uh, as the Secret Service, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he, a lot of it is what his fellow officers told him and what he saw and what he didn't see. But anyhow, yeah. okay, Terry. You know, the thing is, I think people are, some of them expressing concern about, we don't know what we're getting with Donald Trump. But on the other hand, you do know what we know what we're getting <laughs> with <laughs> Mrs. Clinton. Okay, so there that? you go. Well, coming up, a 30-minute meeting aboard a private jet, and what does Attorney General Loretta Lynch say she talked with Bill Clinton about? 
our conversation was uh, a great deal about his grandchildren. Uh, it was primarily social and about our travels. He mentioned the golf he played in Phoenix. Stay tuned to hear why Republicans and some Democrats are concerned about a possible breach of ethics after this. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Was it just a friendly conversation or a conflict of interest? Both Republicans and Democrats in Washington are upset over a meeting earlier this week between the U.S. Attorney General and former President Bill Clinton. The encounter calls into question the impartiality of a pending decision on Hillary Clinton's use of a personal server for State Department emails. Gary Lane has that story. Attorney General Loretta Lynch crossed paths with former President Bill Clinton Monday at the Phoenix airport. She portrayed it as a chance encounter, simply an exchange of personal pleasantries. Our conversation was uh, a great deal about his grandchildren. Uh, it was primarily social and about our travels. He mentioned the golf he played in Phoenix. The 30-minute meeting came aboard the Attorney General's private jet. She said there was no discussion about Benghazi or the investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails. Republicans, including Donald Trump, were quick to criticize Lynch for a possible ethics breach. Who would think that when, you know, you have this massive investigation going on on emails, which is so serious, they'd have a meeting like this. So I was very surprised. And the criticism didn't come from only Republicans. Some Democrats also suggested the appearance of a conflict of interest because of the investigation of the former president's wife when she was secretary of state. I think she should have said, look, I recognize you have a, a long record of leadership on fighting crime, but this is not the time for us to have that conversation. And even David Axelrod, former political strategist for President Obama, tweeted, Lynch was foolish for creating such optics. This is significant because the FBI is still investigating Hillary Clinton's emails and her use of her personal server while she was U.S. Secretary of State. And it is the U.S. Attorney General, Loretta Lynch, who will decide of an indictment on criminal charges should be brought against the presumptive Democratic presidential nominee. The White House insists politics won't play a role in the decision on whether or not to indict Mrs. Clinton. What is paramount in the mind of the president is a commitment to the rule of law and a commitment to ensuring that justice is administered without regard uh, to political affiliation or political standing. Gary Lane, CBN News. Well, in the wake of the controversy surrounding this meeting, Lynch is expected to announce today that she'll accept the recommendations from career prosecutors along with FBI Director James Comey and Bureau investigators about whether to bring charges against Hillary Clinton over her emails and personal server. Well, turning overseas, Israelis are mourning the death of, 13, of a 13-year-old murdered in her bed by a 17-year-old Palestinian. She was a U.S. citizen. And as Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, Israeli leaders are blaming the constant incitement by the Palestinian Authority. The death of Israeli-American Halal Yafa Ariel shocked the nation. A Palestinian teenager snuck into her bedroom and stabbed her to death. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu expressed the emotion of the country. This morning, a terrorist sneaked into the bedroom of a 13-year-old girl, Halal Yafa Ariel. He murdered young Halal in cold blood. The picture of her blood-stained room is almost too hard to see. There's a teddy bear still on her bed, a red beanbag chair, some pictures on the wall, shoes tightly packed in a bin next to her bunk bed. Why would any person do this? Netanyahu blamed incitement by the Palestinian Authority. Just three days before the murder of Ariel, a senior member of Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas's political party told a newspaper, everywhere you see an Israeli, cut off his head. You don't murder a sleeping child for peace. You don't slit a little girl's throat to protest a policy you don't like. You do this because you've been brainwashed. You've been brainwashed by a warped ideology that teaches you that this child isn't human. Ariel was a U.S. citizen and cousin to a senior Israeli cabinet minister. The reality is that this incitement by Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas has resulted in the murdering of children. The vengeance of the Lord is the vengeance of the Lord, but our vengeance is continuing to build on this land. According to a Hebron news agency, the mother of 17-year-old Mohammed Tarira said, 
My son is a hero. He made me proud. My son died as a martyr defending Jerusalem and Al-Aqsa Mosque. Fatah also honored Tarira by declaring him a martyr. Hundreds came to Ariel's funeral. Her mother, Rina, blamed Mohammed's mother. I raise my daughter with love, she said. You taught your son to hate. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Well, here at home, the Pentagon will now allow transgender people to serve openly in the military. Defense Secretary Ash Carter says the change takes effect immediately. Our mission is to defend this country. And we don't want barriers unrelated to a person's qualification to serve, preventing us from recruiting or retaining the soldier, sailor, airman, or Marine who can best accomplish the mission. Transgender service members will receive the same medical coverage as any other military member. For current members of the military, that includes coverage of gender reassignment surgery. Incoming service members must already be in a, quote, stable gender. Well, the 4th of July is among the busiest travel weekends of the year. And if you're one of the millions flying, you can expect to see more airport security. And security will be beefed up in other public places, too. Airports in particular are on high alert after the terrorist attacks at airports in Istanbul and Brussels. So if you're flying, you might want to make sure to get to the airport a little earlier. And of course, we wish everyone a happy and safe 4th. Pat, back to you. We sure do, and we don't hope we don't have any more of these things. But isn't this terrible that they're teaching hate? They're teaching hate, and uh, there, it's being preached in the madrasas. You go into a Christian church, <clears throat> and hopefully the pastor is talking about loving people and love one another, and as I have loved you, that's the message of Jesus. They go into a mosque, and some radical imam may very well be telling them that the thing is to kill the infidels, and uh, you'll go to paradise if you uh, die in jihad. It's, a, uh, it's causing chaos throughout the world. And every time you turn around, every time you open a paper, every time you watch TV, there's one more example of that terrible stuff. And Terry's got the story of another one. Well, coming up, a mass shooting on a military base and the knock on the door no wife wants to get. It's Captain Joseph, and I'm shaking my head no because I don't want to hear it. And I say, oh my gosh, don't tell me John was shot. Watch what happens next when we come back. Angel Arroyo's husband served two tours in Afghanistan and one tour in Iraq. He was stationed at Fort Hood in Texas on April 2, 2014. Late in the afternoon, he pulled into a parking lot near headquarters when a 45 caliber bullet ripped through his neck. My friend calls me and she said, did you know there's a shooting? And I was like, oh my gosh, don't tell me John was shot. 30 minutes later, his captain shows up at the door. I went numb, and he's on the other side knocking and knocking, and I'm shaking my head no because I don't want to hear it. It is. Open the door, open the door. He's alive. Angel's husband, platoon leader John Arroyo, was rushed to Darnall Army Medical Center, where two surgeons immediately began operating to save his life. They soon discovered that a 45 caliber bullet had severed John's jugular vein and lodged deep within the nerves of his right shoulder. One of the physicians was ENT Dr. Alex McKinley. Close proximity gunshot wound to the neck with an expanding hematoma is a grave prognosis. We knew that it was go time. We made an incision over the area to try to control the bleeding. Once we stopped that, we exhaled a bit, but there was still bright red bleeding and so there was additional injuries. We looked and we knew that the bullet had gone through his what's called voice box, the area where your Adam's apple essentially is, your vocal cords, shattered his thyroid cartilage. And we knew that there was probably some significant damage to that area of his neck. To help John breathe, doctors inserted a tracheostomy tube in his neck. Then, Angel was finally able to see him. They took me back there. 
It was not my husband. His head was bigger than a basketball. His tongue was sticking out. It wouldn't even go back in. I just kept praying that everything would be okay. The following day, John was placed in a medically induced coma and transferred to Scott and White Memorial Hospital for additional care. There, doctors told Angel their prognosis for John. At that time, we knew, A, he had lost a lot of blood, B, that his voice was probably gonna be different because of the amount of injury that was sustained in the voice box, and we didn't know if his voice would ever be normal again, and then C, his arm and the movement of his arm based on where that bullet went, we had no idea if that was gonna come back either. And they said he won't be able to talk because he's in a medical coma. So he's got to stay asleep until Saturday. And so I went beside him and I grabbed his hand and I was telling him I love him. And he woke up. When I first see my wife, I tried to sit up and I tried to talk to her I just wanted her to know that I was going to be okay. I told her father before he passed that I would take care of her. And it means everything. I couldn't speak, and I was writing on a whiteboard. He's on medicine. He wouldn't be spelling right. Like, I love you would be I-H-A, just crazy. I didn't know I could love him as much as I did. Two days after the operation, when I first saw him, he was doing his best to speak. He'd put his finger on his tracheostomy tube. He had an intelligible voice, which is very unusual in this kind of situation. We knew right away that he was a fighter, and we knew that faith was a big part of who he was and that he believed 100% that God was behind him and that he was gonna get through his injuries. As John slowly recovered his voice, he began sharing what happened that day. Senator all units, just advised, we have an active shooter currently on Fort Hood. Just be advised, they're saying that the vehicle was a dark Toyota Camry. I've been in combat several times, being a Green Beret. You just know, you just know what shots fired sound like. And as I was looking where the shots were fired, a vehicle pulls up. The next shot I heard, I was hit. John had just parked his car outside the 1st Medical Brigade when a 45 caliber slug ripped through his throat. I see someone walking towards me in the distance. The individual gets close to me within 10 feet, and I realize that it's the shooter. Jesus, help. And that's the only thing I could try to muster was Jesus, help. Probably the simplest prayer I've ever prayed, but it was the most profound because he stopped, looked around, and then walked into a building. I was just paralyzed. I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that he didn't see me. It was God. God shielded me. Eight minutes after the first shot, three medics came running to the scene. Gripping his throat, John called out to warn them. I yelled back to them from across the parking lot, no, I've been shot, there's a shooter. Army Specialist Ivan Lopez opened fire, killing three people and wounding 16 others. Confronted by military police in a parking lot, he then turned the gun on himself. They believe Specialist Ivan Lopez had an argument with a fellow soldier before the shooting. The suspect had been evaluated for post-traumatic stress disorder and was receiving treatment for depression and anxiety. In just a few weeks, John fully regained his voice and was eventually transferred to Brook Army Medical Center, where he continues to receive therapy for his right arm. Last year, John was awarded the Soldier's Medal for heroism above and beyond the call of duty, for warning others on the day of the shooting. And today, he serves as an aide to a two-star general at Fort Sam Houston. When everything was said and done, and I look at the sequence of events between where John was shot, the timing of how quickly he was taken from 
the location to the hospital, and then being rushed right to the operating room with two surgeons who are ready to go, being able to stop that bleeding, all of that in such a short period of time, I think it's nothing short of a miracle. I don't believe in luck. It's Christ. It's God, and I, I can't explain it any better than that. At the end of the day, I should never even be here. They said I would have a trach in my neck for a minimum of six months. It was out in two months. They said, we don't know if you ever talk again. I'm talking to you right now. They said that we don't know what's going on with your arm. My arm moves today. There's no limits when it comes to God. Isn't that a comforting thing to know? You know, we live in a crazy world. Things happen unexpectedly. When John went to work that day, he expected to go to work, do what he'd been told to do, and come home at the end of the day just like usual. But life happens. It happens unexpectedly. What do you do when those things close in around you? Where do you go? John knew at the moment that he faced the greatest challenge he'd ever faced in his life that the name to call on was the name of Jesus. You need to know that in your own life. Many of you know it, but you're not walking with the Lord the way you should be. You're not connected to him the way you should be. Head knowledge isn't enough. God loves you so much. He doesn't want to be God without you. He made you to be completed by a relationship with him. Listen, just ask him. John cried out in a moment of extreme need and God responded. Jesus was there for him. Don't wait for that moment. Cry out today for your own heart, your own life. Determine today to set your feet on a path of life, a path of healing, a path of hope and a future. If you want to pray a prayer to commit your life to Jesus, it's as simple as saying, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I recognize you died for me. Come into my heart. Come into my life. After you pray the prayer, what do you do? It's not just about praying a prayer. It's about living for him. Pat's put together a packet for you. It's called A New Day, and it's filled with wonderful information about how to be a follower of Christ. What does that look like? And it's yours for free. If you'd like to get a hold of this packet, and we encourage you to do that, call our toll-free number. It's 1-800-759-0700. We'll get a new day out to you right away. Well, still ahead, a soldier who served his country for 18 years. It's an honor for me. It's an honor to do what I've done. Thinking about what he does over there has helped me to realize how much we take for granted. We say thanks to an American hero that's coming up. Welcome back to the 700 Club. A federal judge has blocked a Mississippi law designed to protect those with religious objections who didn't want to provide some services to LGBT people. The law would have protected some government employees and businesses from legal action if they refused to serve the LGBT community in marriages, adoption, foster care, and several other services. That law was supposed to take effect today. Now that it's Shark Week, many beachgoers may think that sharks are the number one predator. But the real danger is actually lurking outside your window. Mosquitoes outrank all other animals when it comes to the threat against humans. And Operation Blessing is using Mosquito Week to spread the word. New Orleans credited Operation Blessing with preventing disease post-Hurricane Katrina by their use of mosquito larva-eating fish. Operation Blessing is now testing the effective effectiveness of the animals in Honduras and helping to establish the first mosquito con control department in the country. You can find out more about Operation Blessing by going to their website at ob.org. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, welcome back. You're watching the 700 Club, and we're getting ready to have the 4th of July next Monday. It's getting there, Independence Weekend. After nine tours of duty in the Army, Zevon was ready to go even more. But when the Army discharged him unexpectedly, he was out of work with no way to support his family. 
While the nation follows the Middle East conflict on network news, Army Master Sergeant Zavon has lived it. In his 18 years of military service, he's deployed nine times to war zones, each tour lasting six to 12 months. It's an honor for me. It's an honor to do what I've done, and I'm, I'm very thankful for what it's done for my family and, and, and how it's changed my life, going from a boy to a man. Zavon's biggest supporters are those he leaves behind, wife Ashley and his five kids. Thinking about what he does over there has helped me to realize how much we take for granted, and I feel completely secure with him. I feel equally impressed and proud of her for what she's done to support me through all that. It's humbling to hear her say she's proud of me when I know that I couldn't have done it without her. Zavon was planning on re-enlisting, but due to troop downsizing, the Army declined his request. He received an honorable discharge, but only had a few months to transition to civilian life and find a job. The couple trusted that God would see them through. Having faith that this is all God's plan and He'll take care of us is probably why we're not going as crazy as we would be. Just outside Fort Campbell, Kentucky, the couple attends a Christian military support group called Force Ministries. Force heard about helping the home front and asked CBN to get involved. Force Executive Director Greg Wark sat down with the couple to tell them the news. Helping the home front has decided to help you with this transition by providing you guys with three months of mortgage payments. I thank you so much to think that we're worthy of doing something like that for us. I thank God that He uh, allowed this moment and allowed us this opportunity. We're very grateful for, for stepping in and for CBN stepping in and um, gifting us this. Now, this family can transition into civilian life with a little less stress. I think it's a great program and I hope it continues to help a lot of other soldiers and their families. And we thank you so much. It's, it's a huge burden that, that is lifted off our shoulders. Those guys have sacrificed so much for us and they need a hand. We're doing something that's been started about a year ago called Helping the Home Front. And, uh, that's part of it. We do something to help these worthy people. We can't help them all. We do help as many as we can. And um, if you join the 700 Club, this is one of the things that your contribution will go toward. And in addition, if you join $20 a month pledge, we want to give you victory through life storms. It's a DVD of some dramatic testimonies of people who overcome difficult situations. So call in so you can count on me as we approach the 4th of July weekend. Yes, it, the it is upon us. 4th <laughs> is on Monday and the weekend is now. Yeah. All right, nice questions, let's go Okay, it's time to bring it on. This first one, Pat, comes from Marcella, who says, my question is about the 700 Club praying for people during the live broadcast and then people receiving healing. I don't have cable, so I watch the Monday through Friday broadcast in the evening on the internet. Do healings ever happen through the internet? I've yet to hear anything about that. Well, we don't talk about it, but it happens all the time. Because this program, we, we've begun to understand how God is. God lives in eternity. And he gives us a word now. The thing can be put on a DVD or, or recorded or go into another country or translated, and all of a sudden, a miracle takes place. I don't understand how it works, but all I can tell you is it does. God does answer prayer, and many times <clears throat> people talk to a tape, and the tape talks back to them, you know. Yeah, I'm actually surprised, even in watching the live broadcasts, or I mean, the, the internet yeah, broadcasts. Yeah. Usually when we pray, we begin by sharing stories of people who've experienced miracles. Yeah, all so the time. Sh that yeah. should be on there. Yeah, I don't okay. know why Marcella's not getting that. Okay, this is Joni who says, we've always made it a standard in our home that an unmarried couple does not sleep together or share the same bedroom while visiting us. We have a very good Christian lady friend who has met a nice gentleman and they are dating. They're in their late 70s. I know for a fact they do not have sex but are now sharing a bed. They're coming for a visit from out of state. Should we handle it the same way as if it's inappropriate and we disappear? Prove. It feels ridiculous to be facing this situation at our advanced ages. Please help. Um, I tell you what, at 78, they're out of the game, honey, and uh, I wouldn't <laughs> worry about them 
<laughs> committing <laughs> adultery. You who are being cursed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, don't worry about it. If they if they feel comfortable sleeping next to each other, I mean, uh, who who is sinning? Go ahead. <laughs> this is Diane who says the Bible says something about quote a way of escape when being tempted. But what about drug addiction? Well, um, there. For every sin, there's a way of escape that you may be able to bear. It. That that is talking about persecution and tempt, and not just temptation. It's talking about difficult situations. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're in difficult situation, there is a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Uh, I don't think they're talking about addiction or drug addiction, uh, but there will also the Lord will give you a way of escape if you let Him do it. Uh, but it's not, I think we're talking about persecution, Christians under terrible persecution as is happening all around the world. So that's, that's the real meaning of that. Well, that's all the time we've got. We appreciate you being with us. We leave you with today's Power Minute from Psalm 34. Those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Monday, we say happy birthday, America and celebrate Independence Day with a salute to the men and women in our armed forces. So have a great weekend, have a great 4th of July, and we'll be back for more of the 700 Club next week. We'll see you then, bye-bye.